Let's start with a question about the world of politics today and how it's changed. Uh, how do you see the world of politics now? I think it's, uh, it has changed, uh, but very gradually, so gradually that many people don't notice the changes, in my opinion. I uh, think you're in a better position to, uh, to understand that than I am, perhaps. Uh, but uh, the people are not interested unless it's a personal affair. People are not interested in, in voting. And uh, when a town of eight, ten, th eight or 10,000, uh, a state of eight or 10,000 uh, can get only four or 500 people to, out to vote, there's something very wrong. And I think this is the big change that's come from the early days. Do we as a Republic as a dem democracy then get what we deserve as far as our uh, public servants are concerned nowadays? Well, I think so. Although I'd like to see it the other way. I, I have thought about mandatory voting. And of course, people don't want mandatory voting. I think it would be a good thing to find some way to make people go to the polls and vote their convictions. And uh, or be forfeited something, either tax-wise or some other way. If that were to happen, would, there, would that automatically translate into a, a, a greater interest in politics, or would there be sort of a grudge feeling about, well, we have to do this, we're not interested in doing it? I don't know. I don't know as I ever will know, because I doubt if anyone will ever follow through. I tried it. I, I studied the Australian plan of uh, people voting or having a tax uh, credit or, or deduction. And uh, uh, people didn't pay much attention to it. Do you know if the percentages were greater there, though? Was it a successful system? No. About the same? About the same. If, if you could cha uh, change or shape the direction of uh, federal government nowadays, if you had a hand in, in setting policy, what would you like to see being done? That's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see, I'd like to find a way. I like our system. As uh, Prime Minister Churchill said to me one time when I was interviewing him, that the American uh, political system is the best in the world. It can be kept that way so long as you keep your economy strong and your, uh, your uh, military strong. And I think this is the answer to it. Uh, it's. Uh, unfortunate that people don't realize that they're going to get about what they give. And if they go to the polls and vote, uh, some people say, well, I don't like the candidates. <laughs> My answer to that is, well, then write a name in just to show you that you were there. But they don't do that. As you mentioned, Churchill said you have to keep the economy strong and the military strong. In this day of uh, the end of the Cold War, um, how are the leaders of the world to gauge at what rate deductions should be made in military budgets and yet still be able to uh, keep a position of strength? How can that work? I don't think it does work. And I think this is one of the answers, one of the reasons why I think something should be done. How are you going to know whether there's going to be an attack or, or even by planning? I know of no way. So your position then is to maintain very high levels of readiness for eventualities or potentialities. I think we should always be strong militarily. I think our defenses are more important than almost anything else. And that doesn't mean that necessary, unnecessary spending. I mean strong in what we have, and not in dollars and cents. Do you see the um, spending on such things as health and education as being defense matters? I had never thought of that, no. Some people do. I'm wondering if you can see why they do. A healthy, strong, educated country would be a, a strong, country of defense in defense terms, too. Of course, our health and education are pretty basic, and they both should have uh, equal attention. <clears throat> there, there, of course, the, uh, 
the butter issues and, and the, the uh, sword issues. Um, if it came to pass that you were satisfied that the uh, Commonwealth of Independent Republics or whatever the Soviet Union is called nowadays was no longer any kind of a threat, where would you like to see cutbacks in military spending? Where, where can we save? Oh, I don't think we can come to that. I think this is too early to even, it's well enough to think about it and well enough to think about the future. But I would not want to make a judgment at this time. It's really wishful thinking, I guess. Yes. Mm -hmm. You um, have a, a history in Maine of being very aware of, of state politics as they are, are uh, run, and you've been keeping up on them. What do you think of uh, the current situation in the state? We've had state budget problems recently. What can be done about that? I'm not close enough to be a judge on what is going on. I read as everybody else does, but I'm not at the state house. But uh, the same thing can be done as far as the state is concerned, as, as should be done nationally, and that is the individual person should participate. The individual person should vote, vote his convictions, and not be uh, permitted to uh, stay at home and not, and not vote and then complain. There is a tendency among state legislator, legislatures at times to not decide issues, but to throw the issue back at the people for them to decide. What do you think of that? I think it's very bad. I think that this is exactly what is happening. Uh, the uh, people who don't vote uh, uh, complain. If they went to the polls and voted, they, they'd have a right to complain. Uh, no, I think that's very bad. One thing that's happening now with the increased amount of uh, unemployment is that the welfare rolls are expanding. There's more people out of work and they need help and for whatever reason, uh, mothers of uh, children and mothers aren't wed. There's a number of situations that, that put a demand on the public coffer. What can be done to stop that flow or change the direction of the flow? I don't know. I, I just don't know how you're going to get people to realize that the government is going to be what they make it and the costs equally so and uh, unless they participate and have a say in it they have no right to complain yet when a man or a woman uh, can stay at home and be on welfare and get within five or ten dollars a month uh, in pay and uh, be relieved of that responsibility, I think it's very sad. You mean that they are able under, under welfare to earn within five or ten dollars of what they would normally make on the outside with a private That's what job? I'm told. That's, that's remarkable and that's, I can understand why you're concerned. <laughs> well, in fact I heard a discussion the other day and they were talking about this very, uh, this very thing and uh, the man said, well I stay home and I don't have to work, I can uh, do what I want to do uh, and uh, uh, get get uh, uh, my uh, check uh, it's about five dollars less than I would have gotten if I had been working at the present day labor rates. How can a state government or a or local government put a stop to that? What kinds of things would need to be done? Well I'm told that it would cost so much to have, uh, have all of this checked that it would not be worth uh, the effort and the money, but I can't believe this. It seems to me that there are, should be some way check, to check. Now, for instance, if a, uh, and I'm thinking of a very special uh, problem, if uh, uh, someone uh, is on welfare and gets a job and doesn't take herself off from the welfare, She's getting welfare and pay, too. Now, there must be some way to see that, watch it, and cut it out. The, um, the president, um, last evening as we're recording this, gave his State of the Union address, and it was, by some accounts, his best speech of his career. Um, what is your reaction to it? I thought he did a very, a very, very, made a very excellent presentation. 
Were you pleased with some of his direction, some of his policies? I would not want to judge that unless I analyzed it, but I would say, generally speaking, yes. I, I've noticed you have a tendency to be very careful about painting other people's opinions. Is that something you've uh, held to very closely throughout your life? Well, I, yes. I think I have no right to criticize unless I have something to offer. And if I don't know the exact story, I'd better not be talking about it. Iraq, uh, going back a year from now, Iraq was forcefully evicted from Kuwait by the, uh, the Allied forces, of which the American side was the largest portion. Would you have done anything differently uh, in regards to that war? Oh, goodness. I don't know what I might have done, but I think that uh, I think the president did well to keep his word about going in there and kind of getting out when he said we would, although I would like to have seen them uh, gone just a little longer and taken care of the, uh, the source of all the trouble. What that really means in veiled language is um, either controlling or killing um, Saddam Hussein. That's right. There's no easy way to say no. that. No, that's right. As you read the events of the day and listen and watch the broadcast media, do you um, do you shake your head in disbelief, or have you all have you heard this all before and just shrug your shoulders? I never shrug my shoulders. I uh, always wish there was something that I could do, and I don't know what that something can be, unless you have. Uh, and then there are arguments against mandatory voting, of course. I know you've been coming back to that oftentimes on, as, as a potential solution to this. Um, the, the idea of mandatory voting um, would work, wouldn't it, if the, edu if the public were educated to the point of being able to make uh, good choices. If they, if they aren't able to make good choices, then even mandatory voting might not work. That's the argument against it, yes. How about getting the public to a point of being able to make good choices? How do we do that? Is that just education? Well, I think we, I think we have been going a long time. This, this is not a new situation. It's been building for, for some years, and it's going to take a long time to get back and uh, I'll get to the point where I think we should be. Um, I think you've got to start in the lower grades in school and get young people have the habit of being responsible for uh, their attendance in school or whatever in order to be good citizens later on. And this is not going to be done overnight. It's, got to take, it's going to take some time. This is one of the things that you are involved in and quite happily, as I understand it, talking to young people that come to the center here. Is, do they, can you tell um, through the years, is there a change in attitude or are, are kids pretty much the same as far as being willing to take information from you as far as their curiosity? Well, I think we, of course we get, someone said we get the cream of the crop here. I think that's not true. We get the schools that, that come here by choice. And I, I think that uh, they wouldn't, uh, the, some of them are coming out and be, uh, will be good citizens, but it's going to take some time to to build that interest and uh, uh, as an obligation they have. How do you create the um, the aura of excitement, of curiosity, of interest in a a child? And I say a, a you know sort of a collective noun child, the children of today. Uh, when they're surrounded by so much stimuli uh, on television and in their personal lives, uh, how, how can that be done? In the home and in the schools. I think this all has to begin in the home. And this is something we're getting away from uh, too rapidly. So, turning to the educating of the potential voter, um, some of that, a lot of that education would come naturally from the media, the journalistic uh, enterprises around uh, the country. How closely should the news media look into a politician's life? Well, I think what a person does in his own home is his business, and I'm not sure that that is a part of the uh, outside world's knowledge, but I'm not sure that it should be. I don't know. I'm not able to answer that question. If I can 
um, give you a little more of a question on that. If, if the public has a, a duty to vote, as you would like them to be, to, to have, shouldn't they vote from a position of the most information they can get on somebody? That's right. That's exactly right. And that should be uh, done in the homes, but the homes don't take time for that anymore. If they go to the television, they don't watch the, that uh, kind of a program. Uh, they watch the exciting ones and should be done in the schools. But the teachers have about all they can do to keep up with all that they have to do. They can't do it all. They can help. And I, I think this is the home and the school are the two places that it must be done. It's a tall order. Um, let's turn uh, to the, uh, the idea of press freedoms, how the press gets into a position of being able to ask private questions and being able to get away with delving into people's private lives. Has the press, is the press going too far? Have, has it changed a lot in your, in your lifespan? I can't answer that because I'm not close enough to it. But you are an observer and you, you've noticed through the years that uh, the press, perhaps the press hasn't changed at all. I'm wondering whether or not the, the press is becoming more aggressive. Um, do you remember in your years in Congress whether they were as aggressive? I had always found the press very good to work with and I, I've said through the years at the same time that they give you just what you ask for. And uh, I uh, presume they are digging deeper because it seems to be the thing that the public wants to read and the press gives the people what, what the people want to read. Is that an endorsement or an attack on the press, the fact that the press gives the people what they want to read? Well, I wouldn't think it was either. It's a fact. It's a fact. Mm -hmm then I should say, is that good or bad? Well, I think it's good in many ways. On the other hand, how do they judge what the people want, really want? Do you think that the uh, media, the, the journalistic enterprises around the country should be, uh, should take it upon themselves to give the people uh, what they need and not so much of what they want? No, I don't think it's for the press to decide, although this seems to be what, what they're doing a great deal of the time. I can't answer those questions because I'm not, I'm not close, close enough to either, either group. As you look back over your long career, uh, both in the public and the private, uh, the privacy of before you were in the public eye, what kinds of events pop out uh, in your mind as being particularly good, particularly uh, worth remembering, and, and particularly bad and wishing you couldn't remember? Oh, there's so many that I wouldn't know where to begin. But I enjoyed my service, of course, very much. But I worked very closely to the people. <coughs> and I uh, think that's probably among my fondest memories, that I worked with the people. And had, they felt that I was one of them. I like to think that anyway. This is something that we talked about a little bit before um, we started videotaping, the fact that you have taken it upon yourself throughout your career to answer letters personally. It seems to me that must be quite rare. Do you know of other? Well, you must remember that Maine, uh, as far as population is concerned, is small in comparison to the large states. And I could do that where a, a member of the the Senate in a large state like New York would not be able to do it because of the massive mail that comes in. But I had a very heavy mail because I answered my mail personally. And I felt that if a, if a person took the time and, in, and showed the interest to write me a letter, ask me a question or su suggesting what he would like done, then I owed him a personal answer. And I dictated, I opened my mail, I dictated my mail, I signed my own mail, always. You were, actually, you have a, your own regulation about other people opening your mail, as I understand it. Well, I always felt that if you, for instance, wanted to write me a personal letter, you would know that if it was my personal especially, that no one else would see it. And I thought that was only fair to the people. 
I'm not asking you to judge anybody else, but do you know if this is uh, the case with uh, other public servants nowadays? Is there anybody that you know of who has this same policy? I don't know. No, I don't know. I would think that it would be almost impossible nowadays with, as you say, the volume in other states would be tremendously in high. In the United States. There is, though, now the computer, which you might not have had access to when you were in Congress, that can develop letters at the push of a button. What's your reaction to that? I don't know enough about it. <laughs> I'm out of the... Uh, uh, in fact, I have not. They have the computer here at the library, but I've not gotten into it, so I can't answer computer questions. I think you just don't want to be critical. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know, and I must before anyone else asks me that question. Well, let me describe it to you, because I think it's fascinating. There are, let's say somebody writes uh, to their senator uh, about the, uh, the, the president's uh, speech last night, and uh, what a person in the senator's office can do is on the basis of reading a letter, they can push any number of different pre-existing answers to those questions and format a letter that comes out of a machine already ready for the senator to sign. It has absolutely nothing to do specifically with that person's letter on a personal level, with the exception of perhaps the senator's signature and maybe a little handwritten note at the bottom. I would not like you to know, nor would I approve of it. I think that happens a lot. Well, of course, it has to happen with the volumes of mail. Yeah. But people are writing more letters nowadays than they were perhaps when I was in. Yeah. Although I, I had a heavy mail. I had a very heavy mail, and I still have a heavy mail. I have a mail from all over the country. And you deal with this every day? Every day. Do you ever let it get, a, get behind you? Do you ever let it pile up? I don't intend to, but sometimes I do. I'm always sorry for it. Just out of curiosity, how many hours a day do you spend on correspondence? Oh, I don't know, I would think. Uh, I think we start, I start dictating about 7 o'clock in the morning and they go sometimes an hour and a half, sometimes a half hour. It varies greatly. I would think on an average of an hour a day, mm -hmm. maybe on an average of two hours a day. And then you have an opportunity to sign them and add I, little notes? They come back to me right after lunch, and I read and sign every one of them myself. Mm -hmm. It's quite a discipline. But it's one that I like, and you must remember I am retired. And people want to know what I do in my retirement, and that's what I'm doing. One of the issues that uh, comes up periodically, and I think it's currently fashionable to debate it uh, in, in Washington, is the source of outside income for public servants and whether or not there should be some kinds of restrictions. Uh, there's a lot of demands put on public servants to make appearances, to make speeches. And oftentimes there's a lot of work that goes into the creation of those speeches and those appearances. What's your feeling about compensation? Well, I think you cannot legislate that. I don't think, I don't see any way that you can legislate uh, on uh, such a matter because uh, there are many, many ways to obtain money without the public knowing it, if I understand the, it correctly. I never did it because I didn't do that kind of thing very often. I was busy as I could be doing what I was doing. But um, uh, I did get a uh, fee once in a while. But when anyone says they don't, they don't get fees, uh, I just wonder if they're honest in it. And uh, I don't see how I can say, how the law can say that you cannot take uh, uh, $10,000 uh, contribution for your campaign. Uh, I, I just, I don't know any way. I think a person is, is ethical or is not ethical. And I don't think legislation does a bit of good. And we've tried everything. I can remember way back when I was there. Everything was tried to stop it, but you don't stop it. One of the more popular ways of stopping it, or at least controlling it, would be to enforce some kind of regular disclosure. Is, is that something that's doable? They do that. I think that's already in, for, in uh, use. But I don't know that uh, you have any way of checking it. I think you can, you can get 
for instance, if you are a, an attorney, you can have a retainer. And that may be anything. It may be a contribution for your campaign. It may be a contribution for your uh, personal expenses. It may be anything. How are you going to, how are you going to make it uh, clear to the public? I don't see how you can. There's I think you're either, you have ethics or you don't have ethics. You can't legislate it. One thing that happens oftentimes to public servants is that they get labeled either by their um, opponents or by their supporters or by the press. They're either liberal or they're conservative. They get, they get uh, polarized in their positioning, uh, maybe not personally, but um, at least the label is there, and it's oftentimes hard to get rid of that label. What do you think of that, that, hap that when well, it happens? I, I don't understand it because I don't know, I don't understand labels. I don't know what liberal means. I don't know what conservative means in these days. And so I just, I can't answer your question because I just don't know. Is it, I don't, I would gather then you don't think it's fair that this happens? Uh, fair? In, in terms of being locked into a, a, a label of some sort, whether it be conservative or populist or? Well, I think it's common use of, of language. Uh, I don't know how you can, what do you mean when you say liberal? That's the question, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's really at the bottom of it. That's the answer to it. Yeah. That's your answer to it. When you were working in Congress, you were oftentimes uh, seen as taking the side of liberal issues. And yet, many people have, through the years, characterized you as being basically conservative in your politics. Does that mean that you were pretty much of an independent person? No, I was Another label. I was a Republican, the only label that I had, and uh, I was a, uh, I suppose I was conservative, but again, how far do you go when you're a conservative and you're not a conservative? I'd have to have somebody uh, draw that out for me to be uh, able to say which I was. I, I cast, I got my liberal, uh, liberal tag uh, during the uh, wartime. And uh, when I voted, uh, I had a, I had a, I suppose what you'd call a conservative voting record, which would be probably 95 percent. And uh, uh, when the war time came, I voted for the land, land lease. I voted for uh, the draft. I voted for what was termed as liberal issues. And. I didn't consider them issue uh, liberal. I considered them uh, necessary issues for the world problems. One issue at a time. Mm -hmm. Last question: Are you basically optimistic or pessimistic, or how do you look at our future, our near-term future? I'm very much troubled. I think that people have become so uh, apathetic, so indifferent on uh, public affairs. And perhaps politicians are largely to blame for this. I don't know. I don't know how it comes. But I am very, very greatly concerned and wish I had a, uh, a recommendation that could uh, give us, put us, start us back in the right direction. But it's going to take us a long time to get back there. We have slipped into this period very, very slowly, uh, very apparently permanently, and it bothers me, it bothers me a good deal. Well, thank you very, very much for talking with us, and I can only hope that uh, we find a way out of these things as a, as a country and as a world. Thank you. It's a pleasure.